This is In The Moment. I'm your host, Reverend Ricky Allen Jr. Thanking you, as always, for joining us on this lovely day the Lord has made. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, I just pray that the Lord Jesus Christ is out front leading the way for you and your family hope you're staying safe out here with all this crazy weather we are in march now wonderful wonderful it's almost close to spring that groundhog said six weeks earlier but it surely doesn't feel like it right <laughs> especially for all of us here on the east coast but i do feel and pray that you are doing okay i pray that everything is working in your favor as per god's will and that you are winning out there stay encouraged it's not as bad as it seems so Let's get started. Our morning scripture comes from Proverbs 1631. Proverbs 1631, going out to all of our seasoned believers out there. It reads as follows. Gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. Amen. And of course, if there's anybody out there with gray hair that needs prayer, be sure to go to our website, get-prayer.com, get-prayer.com. Uh, it was getprayer.today. We changed the domain, so I believe either one works still, but be sure to go ahead and check us out there with your prayer requests, all things prayer, also links to the podcast and different things, more in-depth scope on the uh, messages each week here on In The Moment. So with that being said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in moments of uncertainty and trials, we come, we turn our hearts to you, seeking the light of your presence. We acknowledge that our journey is often shadowed by challenges that test our faith and resolve. And in these times, let us remember the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, you are our refuge and strength, and never present help in trouble. Let your Holy Spirit guide us, filling our hearts with peace that surpasses understanding. May we hold firmly to the promise of your love, grace, and redemption, knowing that in Christ, no hardship can ever separate us from your care. Grant us the courage to face each day with hope, not as a fleeting sentiment, but as a Anchor for our souls, secured in the truth of your word. Help us to see beyond our current circumstances to the eternal joy set before us, made possible, possible through the sacrifice of your son. We pray for those among us who are struggling to find this hope. Lord, there are many out here. Reach out to them with your loving kindness that they may feel your presence and be comforted. Through our words and actions, let us be bearers of your light, sharing the hope of Christ with the world in need. In all things, we give thanks, for we know that our future is held in your capable hands. May our lives reflect the hope we have in you, glorifying your name in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our topic today is Beyond Boundaries, Faith That Transcends Circumstances. Beyond Boundaries, Faith That Transcends Circumstances. Uh, we're in 2 Kings 5 again. Uh, we were there last week. We're again there this week. We're cranking all the way back to the beginning of the story of how Naaman began his quest to be healed by the prophet Elisha. It is important to see where this began, this journey that he went on to be healed of this horrible disease. And we find ourselves in 2 Kings 5, starting at verse 2 through 3. 2 Kings 5, starting at verse 2. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria. He will cure him of his leprosy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you now, Lord, help us dive into your word. Help us get focused. Remove the distractions. Forgive us if we've done anything unpleasing in your sight. Help us be really into your word right now. Help us learn the lessons that this little girl has showed us in a few words. These and all things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Beyond boundaries, faith that transcends circumstances. Oftentimes, 
we are surprised where and when a testimony comes. And when that time comes, it's important that we are ready to relay our testimony of how we came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior. When your time comes, you need to be ready to speak. And because we all serve the same Jesus Christ, but have different stories of how we came to know him and came into relationship with him, testimonies are like snowflakes, unique and beautiful. Regardless if they're good or bad, horrible or great, it's your testimony. It's unique. And it's beautiful in God's eyes and beautiful in ours because we can learn something if we listen. First Peter 3, 5, 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16 tells us clearly, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Here's the part. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So here's your assignment today, this week, God willing, if you're here. Are you ready to share your testimony when God presents the situation to do so? Because there's no right time, there's only God's time. And God's time is not our time. And when we respond to God's time with our testimony in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, that provides the moment to do so, the power of our testimony will be seen, felt, and prayerfully will change a life or two. And it's there we see how our faith goes beyond boundaries and transcends circumstances. In 2 Kings 5, 2-3, we find a great example of this. The story is a story of a young girl, a captive from Israel, serving in the house of Naaman, a commander of the army of the king of Syria. Despite her status and situation, her faith and words became a catalyst for miraculous healing and a testament to the power of God. And from this passage, we draw a few observations about what a powerful testimony looks like. One that goes beyond boundaries and carries a faith that transcends circumstances. First, I want you to understand the characteristics of a powerful testimony. First, a powerful testimony can come from anyone, anywhere. A powerful testimony can come from anyone, anywhere. The only thing we know about this young Israelite girl comes from verse 2. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. This is an outsider in their system. Here is someone that has no reason to speak to anyone, but every reason to try and escape, and in the meantime, keep her head down. She's a stranger in a strange land, against her will. She is, by the world's accounts, justified if she keeps her head down because we would consider her a prisoner. Beyond all of this, her circumstances never dictated her faith in God. How many times have we allowed things that go on with us dictate our relationship with God? So many mistakes made, friends lost, opportunities stolen by Satan because we fail after one thing, and that is keeping God first. Beyond race, beyond social status, God first all the time. Now, how do we know she kept God first all the time? Because of verse 3. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Friends, not only can a powerful testimony come from anyone, anywhere, but a powerful testimony speaks of faith and not conditions. Despite her adverse condition, the young girl's focus was not on her captivity, but on the ailments of her master. Because in her master, she saw a suffering soul. Her testimony was not dampened by her situation. Instead, it shone brightly because it was rooted 
in faith. Just a note, a powerful testimony is not about your external condition, but about the steadfast faith within you. It's a reminder that our circumstances do not define our faith. All three of those sentences probably sound the same because they are the same. Set in different aspects of what's going on in your life. Our faith transcends and transforms our circumstances. Let's break down these words. There's a prompting here. If only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria. Now, why is that? The verse continues, he would cure him of his leprosy. But where is the power at? Pay attention to this missional approach. Look at the first word, if. Take a look at that real quick. She begins with that because Naaman's the man of the house. She's been taken captive and she's shown respect. She made it optional. If. She doesn't want to come off wrong to the mistress. Then look at the next thing here she does, and that is recognizes Naaman as her master. She ensures that her unsolicited information, the testimony that comes next, is seen as choice. She never has to step out of her condition to help his condition. And what's the choice? You can stay a leper or consider my words. There are so many sinners out there right now who have chosen to stay in sin and not consider the words of a believer in Jesus Christ who has shown them the way, who has presented the opportunity and options because they just don't want to. They heard you loud and clear, people. If you're out there right now, you've been discipling someone, you've been trying to get them out of the condition that they're in and they've chosen to stay there, well, be encouraged. And know you've done your part. You just keep praying. You just keep praying. How many of you have presented information in the form of a choice? Because you can't make anybody do anything at any given time. See, that's the problem. The world tricks the other souls out here to thinking they're making us become Christians. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're presenting the information. No different than the young girl did here in the scriptures. It's up to you on whether or not you want to accept that information and develop that information and get on this pathway to discovering who God is through Christ Jesus. So we're not making you do anything. Our testimony is that choose to listen or keep going the way you're going. But this is what Jesus has done for me. And if you trust and believe in him, you can have this peace that I have as well. And you can stop chasing the world for its love. That's that's our goal here. That's that's our hope for everybody out there. We want you to stop chasing the world for clout and for its approval of you. You have it right here. I want you to at least consider it. Then she goes into a testimony. What's she testifying to? The scripture says, would see the prophet who is in Samaria. Now notice here she lays the foundation. Who to look for and where to look for him. Then she finalizes with the value of the information. He would cure him of his leprosy. This was said with certainty. This was something of great importance. She was overcome with emotion. Notice the exclamation point at the end of that uh, verse there. She is overcome. She's tired of seeing him go through what, she's, what he's going through with the leprosy. And she's like, oh, if he just could see the prophet, he would be healed. It's that type of emotion that you hear in this text. You may not read it like that, but that's, that is the emotion you see there. It's someone that's just emotional and seeing someone suffer and it just comes out. Have you ever had that happen where you saw someone that's going through something and you knew the answer to their problem, but just didn't have an opportunity to say it, uh, you know, but you just say it, you trust in the words and you just say it. And you pray someone listens. There was no doubts in what she said. No hesitations. This could happen. And this is certainty. This faith in the power of God through the prophet. This statement was so solid. It created what I call a spiritual ripple. Does your testimony have the power to cause spiritual ripples? When we give our testimony, it's like throwing the rock in still water. There's the impact and the proof of the impact, and that's the ripple. 
This is a declaration to her mistress, words that speak volume. She's saying something without saying something. She's saying, now I know that you love him. I know you love that man. And, and I know you're also tired of watching him suffer with this disease. In fact, we're all tired of watching him, watching this happen to him. But I know that he can be helped. Now, here's the information. Do what you will with it because it's your choice in the end. Don't forget, it's the mistress's choice in the end to take information from this captive little girl. She's got to make a choice. There's a choice here. There's a free will here. And with many of you all, you forget that. You want God to do stuff, but you got to choose to do it. It's free will. He's not going to make you do anything. Because it, because it is your choice in the end. What is she saying here? I'm just a nobody telling a somebody about a somebody that is connected to a somebody that can heal his body. That is what she, that's what she's saying there. It's not written that way. Don't, don't go saying, well, he, that's not even about, it's not. I'm, telling, I'm just paraphrasing here, giving you a down-home interpretation of what she's saying. Relax. And then we see the other side of this. Now that we know the characteristics of a powerful testimony, look at the results of a powerful testimony. It inspires hope in action. The young girl's words to the mistress inspired hope in action. Naaman, upon hearing of the prophet in Samaria, took steps to seek healing. The mistress did her job. She told him what, what was going on. This demonstrates how a powerful testimony can inspire others to seek God and take steps of faith. It's a reminder that our words and faith can encourage others to move towards God, seeking his presence and power in their lives. And a powerful testimony can finally open doors for God's work. The faith expressed by the young girl led to a series of events that not only resulted in Naaman's healing, but also in his acknowledgement of the one true God. Her testimony was the key that opened the door for God's miraculous work in Naaman's life. This shows us that when we share our faith in Christ through our testimony, we create opportunities for God to move powerfully in the lives of others. Our testimonies can be the catalyst for transformation, not just for us, but for those around us. We're not bragging, we're bridging. We're creating bridges here. We're bridge builders. We're creating bridges from your horrible situation to the peace of God through Christ Jesus. We're just simply presenting the way to get to the bridge. It's your job to cross it. Here is an ending thought as we wrap this up. The faith expressed by the young girl in 2 Kings 5 is one that we got to remember came from someone we didn't even know. And how many times have you had some wisdom sent to you by a complete stranger in a Walmart? They may have overheard you talking about something. And they just walk by and just give you a few words and you you thank them, you don't know who they are, they smile and you know you keep it moving. It happens often more than we think it does. We just in a fast paced world, we're not paying attention. Here's this little girl taken to be a servant in Naaman's house, who provides a faith based solution. And then on the other side of the story that we talked about last week where he's at the door of Elisha the prophet and the, 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 the servant comes out and tells him everything he needs to do and he gets all upset and he's in a rut because he had a, a, in his mind how they're supposed to go down, it didn't happen that way. And then those servants who were with Naaman at the time of this little fit outside of Elisha's house provided a common sense perspective. Both sides of the story begins and ends with responses to Naaman's problem by his servants. They go down to history as people who were in situations that did not call for them to show love, yet they did. Unsolicited information presented out of the circumstances they watched and because of their love, they spoke up. They didn't let him just suffer. And out of that love, he stayed the course, got healed, and what was the result of all this? Move to the beginning part of verse 15. This is what Naaman says. Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He gets the connection. He recognizes 
the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's seen it for himself. It didn't come without work. It didn't come without people helping him stay on the course. It didn't come without a little girl's voice getting him on the path and some servants who were close enough to him to say, hey, does it really matter what they told you to do? If it's gonna get you healed, why don't you just go do it? What a blessing it is to have people by your side who can bring about perspective, who can start the journey for you through some theological perspective. I know a prophet in Samaria can cure you of your leprosy. Isn't it an amazing thing to have people like that that really shouldn't be where be what they're doing. They shouldn't even be in that type of mentality, but they're doing it because they care for their soul here. They care for them. And because of their care, and because of them injecting the right perspective, one coming from a faith perspective, the other one coming from a common sense perspective, we get a healed individual who comes to God in recognition and honor of the Lord. What, what an amazing thing we see here. here. Here's something else too. Is this not the goal? When you get someone started on that journey to witness God for themselves, when you're beside them and you're keeping them in perspective of the faith that you have and what has been said for them to get where they need to be, and you see them take hold of it and trust in it, and they finally get transformed, is it not the goal? This is not about recognition. I could go, I, I pastor a church, I could go for years in this city and never have anybody mention my name at an event and in the paper on the internet about anything my church does, let alone talking about me. My question is only one thing. Did I say something that prompted you to get closer to God? That, that, that's it. Have I said something from the scriptures? Have I proclaimed something from the scriptures? Have I said something in my testimony of how I got here with the Lord Jesus Christ? Have I said something to you that prompts you to turn back or turn to him for the very first time? Because I'm just someone that knows somebody that I want you to know so that you can move from being and feeling like a nobody here to a somebody here. And there's in, in a relationship with Jesus Christ who makes nobody somebody's daily and wants to tell you in relationship with him, you are somebody, even when the world says you are nobody. Know the Lord, believe in the Lord, trust the Lord. Don't sit there and get misled by people around you who do not want you to see God. You know, the funny thing about Satan is he will allow Christians to feed his people, clothe his people, talk to his people. But the moment we start getting to the lock, the shackle of your soul, he cuts it all off because he doesn't want you doing that. But we're going to do it anyway. We're going to show you a life that you've never seen. And that is a life with Jesus Christ. And maybe you're out there right now. You don't know the Lord. Maybe you don't understand the peace that goes beyond all understanding. You don't understand what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to contact us via the information presented early in the show. Get-prayer.com. One more time. Get-prayer.com. And I want you to contact us. Ask for prayer. Look at our prayer resources and, and look at... Uh, what you can do to help in your prayer journals, your faith journals, uh, all things prayer. Depending on what's going on that day, you might see a prayer. You might receive a prayer. Subscribe. We would love to have you on our subscriptions. We're growing uh, a little bit each day, and we're, we want you to be a part of that praying family this year more than ever because of the elections and everything that's going on. You might be worried and all the stuff and things and the things and stuff. Reach out to us. Be encouraged. The Lord is with you.
God is waiting for you. Will you trust him today? Will you trust him even when the world says you're nobody? Will you trust in the fact that if you just get around people that can steer you in the right direction, you'll get there? Maybe you're someone that's in a circumstance right now that the Lord has prompted you to say something you haven't said it yet. Now it's your time to be like the young girl here in 2 Kings 5. Put the information out there. Do it the way she did it. She gives a fantastic model on how to do it. And then let the people that you're trying to help decide for themselves. But don't think you can control them. Let them make the choice and pray for them. That's all you can do. All right. So until next time, may God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And God willing, we'll talk to you next week. You take care.